Today is the first day of 2023, and uh, as I was thinking and planning and about what I was going to do this on this first day of the year, I decided just to charge fro forward and and just begin um, to start over, uh, start again with our uh, chapter by chapter, verse by verse study of of the Bible. Um, and so what I've decided to do today, uh, well, for the next couple of months, we're going to be going through the, for the letters, Paul's letters to the Thessalonian church, um, First and Second Thessalonians. It should get us through the next couple of months. Um, I'm looking forward again to seeing, you know, how the Lord's going to bless this church and you this, this upcoming year. And as I was getting ready again, I, I came across this, this, this poem, and I wanted to share it with you all, and I want you to listen carefully. It says, and it goes like this, I am the new year. I am an unspoiled page in your book of time. I am your next chance at the art of living. I am your opportunity to practice what you've learned about life during the last 12 months. All that you sought and didn't find is hidden in me, waiting for you to search it, but with more determination. All the good that you tried for and didn't achieve is mine to grant when you have fewer conflicting desires. All that you dreamed but didn't dare to do all that you hoped but, didn't, but did not will, all the faith that you claimed but did not have, these slumber lightly, waiting to be awakened by the touch of a strong purpose. I am your opportunity to renew your allegiance to him who said, behold, I make all things new. Beautiful poem. Uh, if you want to get a copy of that, I'll share it with you to, to remind you. Um, again, new year, new opportunities, new blessings. So, uh, yeah. So before I begin um, today, let me pray. Let's pray and ask the Lord to, to bless us this morning. Lord Heavenly Father, uh, yes, we are thankful that uh, you've given us a brand new year, Lord. We made it through uh, the challenges of 2022. Um, and now you've brought us here, Lord, and we don't know what the future holds, only you do, but we know that you're in control and that everything and everyone is in your hands, Lord, and that our lives are safely also in, in your hands, Lord, and there's no better place to be than to be there under the safety of your, of your wings. So, Lord, I just pray that you will, as you've done the past few ye years since we started, Lord, I pray that you will bless this morning's service. I pray that you will minister to the hearts and minds, uh, to those that are here, those that are listening to this message, those that are watching it later on. I pray that you will also Heal broken hearts, Lord. Heal, heal broken lives, Lord. And you will restore marriages and relationships, Lord. You're a good and wonderful and beautiful and merciful God. We know you're going to do some great things, Lord. So bless this service, Lord. Fill this room with your spirit, Lord. Remove distractions. So we now sit at your feet and hear, your, hear the, the message you have for us this morning. Pray this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Now, the first book by any famous author is usually highly prized as indicating earliest emphasis and gift of communication. Well, 1 Thessalonians may well be Paul's first inspired letter. 
the amazing amount of Christian teaching that the apostle was able to fit in this short, at his short stay in Thessalonica is clearly indicated by the many doctrines he discusses as already known by the Thessalonians. Today, the rapture and the second advent of our Lord are widely believed and looked for by evangelical Christians. But this wasn't always so. The revival of interest in his doctrine, especially through the writings of the early brethren of Great Britain, was largely based on 1 Thessalonians. Without this short letter, we would be terribly deprived in our understanding of the various aspects of Christ's return. And so I believe it's important that we cover this letter and the second one thoroughly. Um, there's a lot of things I probably won't be able to, to cover, but I'll get, I'm sure I'll get to the, you know, to the, through most of it. Um, you also have um, a task to also go home and afterwards study it, find, you know, um, other Maybe the Lord wants to speak further to you, uh, further to you uh, through our readings these up next upcoming weeks. But yes, I will try to cover as much of this letter as I possibly can with the time that we have. It's a lot of great, as I mentioned. There's a lot of great things in here, and um, a lot of great messages, doctrines. Um, and I think uh, I'm excited to, to teach it, to share it. Um, and I'm excited to see how the Lord is going to speak to you through, the, through this letter. Now, one of the key themes of this entire first letter, now I'm going to focus mostly on the first letter, the introduction to 1 Thessalonians, but I will be mentioning also... Um, 2 Thessalonians, slightly. But the key theme of this first letter is the coming of Christ for the church. That's going to be the key theme, so it's something to keep in mind as we go through this book. Now, we do have a key verse, some key verses, then. That's where I want to turn to. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And... We will eventually get there in a few weeks, and I will cover it more, cover it more thoroughly. But um, I want to share it now because, again, it's relevant. It's our key theme for this entire letter. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And, again, these are the, the verses 9 and 10 be considered key verses. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. The Word of God says, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we, we may live together with Him. Let me share some background information about this letter. Um, as If you haven't been with us, uh, as we start, every time we start a new book, I like to give a thorough, really thorough, good introduction to this letter, to, this, um, to any book that I start. And uh, I just want you to be well prepared, know what's, gonna, what's happening in the background. I want you to uh, just, uh, you know, just have a general good understanding of what's been happening here. Uh, in some context to this, to this letter. In regards to the author, well, the Apostle Paul is widely regarded as the author of both 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. And this is so for a couple of reasons. First, there's external evidence. That external evidence is found in the writings of Polycarp, Ignatius, and Justin. And the second is internal evidence. 
which shows or reveals that um, there are a lot of similarities in vocabulary, style, and theology with all of Paul's other letters. Now, scholars believe that Paul wrote this first letter to the Thessalonian church from the city of Corinth around A.D. 51, just a few months after having preached in Thessalonica on his second missionary journey. Now, the mention of Silas or Silvanus there in verse 1 and Timothy as co-senders may indicate Paul's intent to present the missionaries as a united group. You see, upon leaving Thessalonica under duress, Paul, Silas, and again, when I say Silas, I'm speaking of Silvanus. Um, Paul, Silas, and Timothy traveled to Athens by way of uh, Berea. But after a short time in Athens, Paul felt the need to receive a report from that newborn church that he planted in Thessalonica. So, in order to offset any Thessalonian disappointment that Paul hadn't come to visit them or disappointment that he wasn't going to go visit them, he sent Timothy back there in order to minister to the new believers that were there. See, Paul wanted to check on the state of the Thessalonians' faith for fear that false teachers might have infiltrated their number. However, Timothy soon returned to Paul with a good report, prompting Paul to pen 1 Thessalonians as a letter of encouragement to new believers. Some have suggested that Paul wrote this letter not only to commend the Thessalonian believers for their steadfastness in persecution, but also to answer questions they sent to him through Timothy. Now, yeah, um, there isn't really any external proof, evidence of any documents containing these questions. But it's obvious from chapters 4 and 5 that uh, Paul wrote, uh, uh, that Paul wrote that he answered some of those questions that they had. Now, also another reason for Paul's writing was to correct some misinformation that was going around and also some false accusations that had circulated after Paul had left Thessalonica. And so, thus, Paul also wrote to exhort them to go forward in their faith. Paul, man, he's, he, he was really impressed by the faithfulness of the Thessalonians in the face of persecution. He wrote to those Christians there at that church, in that community, with the, with the goal that they would continue to grow in godliness. Paul knew that the people there had been exposed to false teachings from those in the opposition, for those in opposition to the way of Jesus Christ, and also those who were opposed to or going against the grace of God. And Paul also understood that unless the young church continued to mature in its faith, the danger would only increase over time. And so with that in, with that in mind, Paul taught the people, that any spiritual growth will ultimately be motivated by their hope in the ultimate return of Jesus Christ. See, Paul was never interested in simply telling people to pull themselves up 
by their bootstraps. For he knew that what ultimately inspired change, what ultimately inspired change, and think about this too as we start the new year, what ultimately inspired change was a life of consistently waiting or consistently walking in the power of God's spirit. And so to a group of young Christians with questions and uncertainties, Paul offered the hope of Christ's return, providing both comfort in the midst of questions and motivation to godly, godly living. This letter here, this first letter, presents four major themes. Four major themes. First, Paul's conduct in his ministry. Paul's ministry focused on two aspects. The impartation of the word and the sharing of his life. The gospel didn't come in word only, but in power and deed as well. Paul's motives were to please God and to express his concern for the Thessalonians' Thessalonians welfare. His message didn't come in error, uncleanness, and deceit, but in purity and truth message he delivered, he shared, was in purity and truth. Also, Paul didn't use his ministry as a cloak for covetousness. This was demonstrated by his working to provide for his material needs. The second major theme we'll be seeing here is persecution. The Thessalonian church was founded in the midst of persecution. Paul had to leave the city for that reason, and the, and the church continued after he left. And so Paul encouraged the believers there not to be shaken by these afflictions because Christians are certain to suffer. Just because you're a believer doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer afflictions and persecutions. You should expect it. It's how you deal with those persecutions and those afflictions that will say a lot about how much you trust in the Lord. How much you or how how much you really are walking in faith in him. Third theme is sanctification. See, salvation isn't finished once a person believes in Christ and receives forgiveness of sins. Paul's prayer for the believers in Thessalonica in chapter 3, verse 13, was that God would establish their hearts blameless in holiness before God. He pointed out that God's will for them was to abstain from sexual immorality and to love one another. Paul used his example of work to encourage them in their own, um, in their own work so that they would not be unnecessarily dependent on anyone. Christians, it would work. And we'll, again, we'll cover that when we get to, to, um, to chapter 4 and 5, but it's supposed to work be, and not be unnecessarily dependent on anyone. All right, fourth. Fourth theme we'll see here in this letter is the big one, the second coming of Christ. Jesus' return is mentioned in every chapter of 1 Thessalonians. 
specific attitudes, events, and encouragements about the day of the Lord are given with an assurance that Christians are not, are not appointed to God's wrath. Now, I'll give, talk more about that in just a minute. But overall, uh, 1 Thessalonians is a letter from a spiritual father to his children. Paul pictured the church as a family. The word brethren or brother is used 19 times in the first letter and nine times in the second. And he reminded them of what God did for them through his ministry. And when we get to 2 Thessalonians in about a month or so, Paul will be writing to correct certain wrong ideas and wrong practices relating to the doctrine of the Lord's return. So what's the significance of this letter? Why is it important for us to... Why is it important? Why did he have to pen it? Why is it important for us to... Why is it in our Bible? Why ought we study it and... Or read it and study it. Everyone, everyone would like to have some insight into what their future holds. Wouldn't you? I know I would. How much more so when it comes to the end of the world and times? First Thessalonians provides Christian with the clearest biblical passage on the coming rapture, the coming rapture of believers, an event that will inaugurate the seven-year tribulation. At the rapture, Christ will return for his people. The dead in Christ shall rise first, while those still living will follow close behind. All believers all true and faithful believers. And again, the Lord only knows. Can't be judging, you know. But all believers will meet Jesus in the air to begin an eternity spent with the Lord. Isn't that a beautiful image? That's why this letter is so important. How can we apply this letter as believers? Each New Testament letter has a special message or blessing that is uniquely its own. Romans, for example, emphasizes the righteousness of God and shows that God is righteous in His dealings with both sinners and believers. 1 Corinthians Corinthians focuses on the wisdom of God, and 2 Corinthians on the comfort of God. Galatians is the freedom letter, and and Philippians is the joy letter, while Ephesians stresses the wealth that we have in Christ Jesus. So then, what's the special blessing in the message of 1 and 2 Thessalonians? Let me tell you. It's the message of the return of Jesus Christ and how vital, how how this vital doctrine can affect our lives and make us more spiritual, draw us nearer to God. Again, as I mentioned, every chapter in 1 Thessalonians ends with the reference of the coming of Jesus Christ and each reference relates to the doctrine to a, and each reference relates the doctrine to a practical aspect of Christian living. In other words, Paul didn't look on his, doc, on his doctrine as a theory to be discussed, but as a truth to be lived. These two letters encourages us to live in the future tense. Since Jesus could appear at any time, 
we are to practice the promise of his return in our manner of life, in the way we live. Let me repeat that. We are to practice the promise of his return in the way we live. Again, when we get to the second letter, we will discover additional, uh, discover additional truths concerning future events and the church. Now, it's important, again, to keep in mind that the second letter was written to correct the confusion that had arisen because of our Lord's return. Some believers thought that the day of the Lord, the time of tribulation, had already arrived. And they wondered when the Lord would appear. So the best way, perhaps the best way to grasp the major messages of the two, le- of the, the two letters is by contrast. First Thessalonians, we see that Christ comes in the air for his church. In Second Thessalonians, Christ comes to the earth with his church. In 1 Thessalonians, a sudden secret rapture that could occur any time. In 2 Thessalonians, a crisis that is part of a predicted program. In 1 Thessalonians, it could occur today, right now, this very moment, the twinkling of an eye. In 2 Thessalonians, it can occur only after certain events happen. 1 Thessalonians, the day of Christ. 2 Thessalonians, I'm already getting confused. Did I say, okay, 1 Thessalonians, the day of Christ. 2 Thessalonians, the day of the Lord. Now, here's the thing, folks. I know there's a lot of great godly men a lot of great, true believers and a lot of good churches that differ in their interpretations of prophecy, particularly the matter of the church escaping or entering the time of tribulation. My own position and the position of this church is that the church will be taken to heaven before the tribulation. And then we'll return to earth with the Lord to bring the tribulation to a close. And uh, the reference to that is in Revelation 19.1, or 19.11, I'm sorry. I see 1 Thessalonians emphasizing the rapture of the church and 2 Thessalonians, the revelation of the Lord with the church when he comes to judge. <coughs> However, the practical spiritual lessons of these truths shouldn't be lost in debates over interpretations. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't be debating where now you're getting mad and angry and, you know, Spiritual lessons that we can learn will be lost in those debates, those debates over interpretations. You see, you've heard this before, many of you. We can agree, we can disagree without being disagreeable. We can disagree without being disagreeable. My own conviction and I know many of you feel the same way, is that we will be delivered from the wrath to come. I believe that the Lord wants us to live in constant expectation of His coming. I've studied carefully and heard the debates and heard the explanations of all the other positions And I do, as I said, I respect the men who hold them. But I do. 
I do lovingly disagree with them. Here's the thing, though, my brothers and sisters. Paul didn't write these letters to stir up debate. His desire was that these letters bless our lives and our church. The doctrine of the Lord's return isn't a toy to play with or a weapon to fight with, but a tool to build with. Believers may disagree on some of the fine points of Bible prophecy, but we all believe that Jesus Christ is coming again to reward believers and judge the lost. And we must all live in the light of His coming. You all must live in the light of His coming. With that being said, Paul's focus on Christ's return provides water for the thirsty soul today, encouraging growth in maturity by providing hope in the midst of suffering or uncertainty. Now, Paul's specific practical instruction for this process of sanctification can be applied directly to our current circumstances. Are you going through a tough time? Do you get bad news? Is whatever horrible thing that's been going on since last year is, is it now being rolled over into 2023? By clinging to our hope in Christ, we may see several, several clear results in our lives. Avoiding sexual immorality, refusing to defraud others, appreciating those Christians who serve on your behalf, refusing to repay evil for evil, rejoicing always, praying without ceasing, and giving thanks in all things. That's deep. Giving thanks in all things. And those are just to name a few. This list, of course, isn't exhaustive. But the first letter through the Thessalonians makes clear, makes it clear that you you, my brothers, as a Christian, should expect to grow in holiness over the course of your life. You should expect it. Our study of this letter, of these letters, but again, specifically here in the next few weeks, this first letter, I think I got to sneeze. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, our study of these letters, really, they should give you assurance. They should give you assurance for the future. Encouragement in witnessing and walking with the Lord. Should bring comfort in the loss of a Christian loved, of, of Christian loved ones, and it should bring stability in a world that's very confused, very unsure of itself. You've seen it. You see, I, I know you see the same things I do, because the Spirit of God that's living in me shows me, and I'm sure he shows you too, man, this world is it's going crazy. Definitely a lot of confusion there, out there. People are confused about 
gender, sexuality, truth, education, almost everything. So much uncertainty and doubt for them, but for us who could see clearly, we know. We know what the truth is. You know what the truth is. So this letter will bring you comfort. You see all that craziness around you. Because you know, you will know that something better is coming. Someone said this morning, God's going to do some big things this year. My answer was, hopefully it's the rapture. That's the big, that's as big as I can think of right now. You know? That's what we're waiting for. Are you waiting for it? Are you waiting for that moment when all of a sudden you'll find yourself face to face with the Lord? In your new bodies, man, it's going to be such an amazing time. It should give you hope. It should give you that encouragement. And even when you're in the dumps, even you've gotten the worst news possible, the back of your mind, you know something better is coming. At that's it's only temporary. I'm mean, looking forward, and as I said in the beginning, to what God is going to show us here with this letter. And I hope that you will get the encouragement that you need. I hope that you will hear the words that the Lord wants to speak to you specifically. But you have to be open to it. You have to be willing. You have to come on Sundays, leaving the baggage that you brought with you, leaving it outside those doors. Or just handing it over to the Lord during worship. You do. The Lord will speak to you more powerfully, more effectively when your mind is clear and your heart is open. That's when those seeds will be planted that's when, you know, he just does his work. And some seed grows quickly and some grows slowly, but all seed, especially when it comes to his word, will produce fruit. Friends, I do believe the time is short, and I do believe that... Um, getting closer and closer to that time when he will take us home, whether it's by breathing our last breath on earth or whether it's through the rapture. And again, I ask, are you ready? We'll get more into the subject when we get to that chapter, but before I close, I want to tell you that you can't have that hope. Jesus Christ came to earth to die for you. He came, shared the gospel, shared the good news, was betrayed, handed over, was tortured, was beaten, was hung on a cross, and he died to forgive you of your sins every past, present, and future sin. He's there on the cross, and he wants you to come to him and sincerely ask him to forgive you, and he will. His holiness, his righteousness, when you do that, and when you accept him, when you, he becomes the Lord of your life, his right, righteousness comes now upon you. It's imputed. 
and now you now become righteous and holy in the sight of God. But by not doing that, the Lord only sees, the Lord only, God only sees you as a sinner. He can't stand looking at you. He can't stand sin. Our holy and righteous and beautiful God cannot stand the sight of sin. But once you're covered by the blood of Jesus, you're washed, and now you become white as snow. That's how the Bible describes it. So if you're ready and you want to receive that forgiveness, you want to begin 2023 on a new course, on a new path, on a righteous and good path, on a narrow path, I want you, I want to invite you to come to the cross and ask Jesus to be the Lord of your life. And once you do that, once you, I'll, I'll be saying a prayer, leading you in a prayer to do that, but if you sincerely pray that, the Lord, the Holy Spirit will come make his home in you. And as we go through First Thessalonians, it's going to make a lot more sense. You know, it's, going to really, it's going to be a lot more clearer to you than ever before. So again, if you're ready and want to receive Jesus, I want you to close your eyes wherever you're at. If you're in a safe place, if you're driving, pull over if you can, um, take a break, um, and uh, close your eyes and bow your head. And the Lord knows what you're going through, the hurt, the pain being left by a loved one, the hurt and pain of uh, pain you caused others. He will forgive you. So if you're ready to offer him your heart, with all sincerity, pray this. Lord Jesus, I admit my sin. I know now that I'm a sinner. And I ask you to please forgive me. I now believe in my heart that you died for my sins and confess with my mouth that you rose from the dead. And I'll repent of those sins, I repent of all my sins and turn away from them. I confess you from this moment on as my personal Lord and Savior. No one else, no other idols, just you. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for saving me. Now I ask you to fill me with the Holy Spirit so that He may help guide me, teach me in my new born again life. In your name, amen. If you prayed that, welcome to the family of God. I want you to reach out to us and let us know um, your story. And if you need help in your next steps, we can definitely help you with that. So let us know. Um, but you're not supposed to follow this path or walk on this path uh, alone. 
you need others, other believers, to encourage you, to strengthen you, to rejoice with you. So if you're here locally, come visit us, come check us out. You're, there's no obligation for you to stay or be here. We're not going to sign you up for any kind of membership. You don't have to necessarily take any classes. Um, she wants you to sit here and hear the Word of God being taught. Um, I want to thank you for being with us and checking us out on this first day of the year. I look forward to seeing you these next upcoming weeks as we go through this letter. Uh, we love you. Have a great week. We'll see you again soon. soon. Goodbye. Thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope you were blessed by Pastor Angel's message. For more information about Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, such as our service time or how to get connected, please visit our website at fvccelp.com. If the Lord is leading you to give to the ministry of Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, there's a PayPal link in the video description below. Once again, thank you so much for visiting us here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. We hope to see you again soon.